Hey, welcome back, everybody. I'm J.B. Shreve, and this is the Faithful Considerations podcast. Today, we're starting a new series, looking at the days of King David, the life of King David. For those of you who want to follow along with us, my hope is that this podcast series will be a big assist in helping you to understand the books of First and Second Samuel. From a purely, I guess, literature standpoint, these are two of the most enjoyable books of the Bible, as well as deeply spiritual. So what I want to do in this series is help bring to life the incredible account of the life of King David, his times. And that's what that's what's recorded in those books, and that's what we're going to try to capture in this 10-part podcast series. You can follow along with us at the web at jbshreve.com. If you're not already doing so, uh, be sure and subscribe there. New episodes are going to drop weekly for the next 10 weeks in this podcast series. And I think that's about it. I hope you enjoy this introduction episode today where we look at the origin story for King David. Every hero has an origin story. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. For those reading along with the episodes, you'll want to cover the books of Judges and Ruth to stay on track with what we cover in this podcast episode today. I think that's about does it. Let's go ahead and jump into today's podcast episode on the days of David. So when most people jump into the story of David, they jump right to his anointing as king. Maybe they go all the way to Goliath, the fight with Goliath. Those are the famous pieces, right? To really get the juice out of this story, though, we have to take a step backward and consider the setting first. The setting makes the story come alive. In my in my view, it does. When You wouldn't jump right into the story of Luke Skywalker by going to his taking up the Jedi sword. You wouldn't go to Bilbo Baggins and talk about him trying the, tying the ring around his neck. You got to understand the times that this hero lives in to get a real feel for the mire that they crawled out of and comprehend the, I guess, the heights that they climbed to. So the story of David, it wasn't the story of David really until he was dead. Before that, when he arrived on the scene, we're looking at the story of the judges. This is what he was born into. Not a happy time. It was chaotic. It was oppressive. No one knew what each new generation would bring forth. The story of Exodus and the Israelites' deliverance from Egypt and conquest of the Promised Land concludes with the life of Joshua. Israel's on the march. And in some of the stories, the stories of conquest, we see that the people, the original inhabitants of this Promised Land, they've been living in fear, waiting for the arrival of the Israelites. They don't understand what's taken them so long. You know, they've wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. What took them so long? The Israelites take out just Jericho. They, they put the, the kings and the inhabitants of the lands to flight. The book of Joshua, that's the age of conquest, the day of fulfillment of the promises of God. But it's not all finished there. By the end of the book, by the end of Joshua's life, we see there's more lamb. There's more people left to conquer for the next generation. But that generation doesn't do it for some reason. As Joshua leaves the scene, he dies. And Israel, as a nation, begins to veer off track from the direction of God. Remember, at this time, there's no king. Moses wasn't a king. Neither was Joshua. They were the appointed leaders. But as we leave the book of Joshua, we come to the book of Judges. That's next up in, in the, just the chronology of Scripture. And that's the era of Gideon, of Deborah, of Samson. We think of it as a time of heroes, and, and these guys were heroes, but they were once-in-a-generation heroes. For the people living at that time, these aren't heroic times. When you look into the background of each of these char characters in the book of Judges, you can kind of see that's pretty obvious. In the time of Deborah, they couldn't find a man to lead in Israel. Just a bunch of weakness, a bunch of apathy. Gideon himself, when it comes to him, when we get to his story, he's literally hiding in a hole to thresh wheat. And that's kind of like the ultimate picture of futility right there. Samson, another one of the judges, he's borderline lawless, even on his best day, and no one can stop him from just doing whatever he wants to do at any given moment. He killed a lot of Philistines, but he also, upon his death, he leaves this sense of all that might have been. If he had just exercised just a mind, the smallest amount of level of self-control and duty to his calling, his gifts, these guys were heroes, the judges were, but they lived in dark times. Twice in the book of Judges, we read these words. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In fact, the second time we read that statement, 
It's in the final verse of the book of Judges. The writer's just putting a cap on it to make sure we get it. It's a time of highs and lows, instability, unpredictability. And this verse right there, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That tells us why. There's no governance in the land. Yes, there's no king, but there's also no self-governance. The people are, are they're not being governed by the law. If, if you remember in Deuteronomy, the final words of Moses, that was what that book contains, the final words of Moses to the people of Israel, he warns that they would have a choice before them. They could obey God or they could disobey God. All sorts of blessings would come through obedience, but all sorts of curses through disobedience. Well, the book of Judges is the sign, I guess generationally there are signs, that the curses are starting to fall upon the nation. It was hoped that the people would, would choose to do what's right, to obey. But here we are, only a few generations removed from the conquest under Joshua, and they keep failing. We have idolatry. We have, a, we have sellout priests. These are the stories within the book of Judges. We have Israelites victimized by surrounding nations and armies. We even see the verge of civil war taking place within the tribes at several points. And just as it would seem that things couldn't get any worse, well, a judge would arise. Someone like Gideon or Samson or Deborah or Jephthah or, or the many who make up that list of heroes and characters in the book of Judges. Things stabilize for a generation, but then when that judge passes away, well, things start to sour again. Into that environment, the age of the judges were introduced to Ruth, this Moabite woman. Now, if you're reading through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the story of Ruth at first doesn't, well, it just doesn't quite seem to fit. You've got Genesis, the story of creation and the, the selection of Abraham. You've got Exodus, the deliverance of Abraham's descendants from Egypt. You come to Leviticus, the instructions for the, the priestly tribe of these people of God that he selected. Then you've got Numbers and Deuteronomy, the story of Moses leading the people through the wilderness and his final words to them. Then Joshua, of course, the tale of conquest, the promised land. Then you've got Judges, the generations that followed the conquest. And then you come to Ruth. This short, it's only four chapters long, this short book doesn't seem to fit. It's kind of a love story. It's set down in the time of the Judges, but it's not part of the Judges, really. Ruth isn't anyone famous. She's not a judge. She's not... She's not someone you would have remembered, and you kind of wonder, what's this book even doing here? No one she's related to or that she relates to in, within the book of Ruth is a judge. There's really only one reason this book is included in the Bible. And we find later, at the end of the story of Ruth, in the final verses of that book, she's the grandmother to Jesse, and that's David's father. So she's in the royal ancestry, ultimately in the ancestry of Jesus, and that's why she's included here. But this story, the story of Ruth, it gets more interesting when we look at it even closer. And that's one of the things I love about the story of David. The closer you look, the more you find and the more interesting it gets. The book of Ruth starts out by explaining this was in the time of the judges and there was famine in the land of Bethlehem. So this guy and his wife, Naomi, they go to the land of Moab for relief. Well, the guy dies there and he leaves Naomi and her two sons to fend for themselves. Well, the sons marry Moabite women. And one of them, one of these women that they married, is named Ruth. The other was Orpah. Well, then the two sons die. So you have Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, the, these three widows just struggling to survive. Naomi hears that there's food back in Judah, in Bethlehem, where she's originally from. And she says, I'm going to go back there. She tells Ruth, she tells Orpah to return to their own families, their own gods, and even though they've been good to her, they don't need to feel like they owe her anything. They're young enough to remarry. They're young enough to, to have children, find a way to survive with a new sugar daddy if necessary. As for Naomi, she just needs to find some bread at this point. Well, Orpah goes, but not Ruth. As Orpah walks out of their life forever, Ruth, in the book of Ruth, it captures the story. She turns to Naomi and says these famous words. This is kind of like the, the climax of the book. It's captured in Ruth 1, verses 16 to 18. But Ruth replied, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I'll go. Wherever you live, I'll live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there, I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. 
When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. That's the famous verse from Ruth 1, 16 to 18. That's the New Living Translation. translation. Really cool story, right? Even if it does seem like a slide trail from the, the bigger story being told from Genesis up to this point. But this is actually where we have to pause. Ruth is talked about here. All right, her story is told here because when she goes back to Judah with Naomi, she meets a man named Boaz and becomes his wife. And through that union, she becomes the great grandmother of David. So this side story we now we now read, we recognize we have a Moabite uh, woman captured in the family and the lineage of the most famous king of Israel. And if she's in the bloodline of David, that means she's also in the bloodline of Jesus, right? So. This is where we got to go dig, dig deeper. We got to dig down deeper into the story of Ruth. Why is this here? What's it about? Now, real quick background on the Moabites and who they were. Ruth was a Moabite, but who were the Moabites? Well, if you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, remember that one? Lot and his families, how they escaped from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember how his wife, she looked back, she turned to a pillar of salt. So all that's left was Lot and his two daughters. Now, Not the greatest of fathers, not the greatest of relationships here. But if you read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis, when the mob comes for the visitors to Lot's house in that city, or these cities, it's a pretty graphic scene, all right? And Lot, presumably in the name of Middle Eastern hospitality, he offers the mob his daughters rather than these strangers as... uh, I I guess that would be dishonorable if these strangers were taken from his house and molested by this mob. So, you know, I guess the daughters are saying, thanks for that, Dad. But but things go from bad to worse after they flee the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the mom is gone now because she looked back and she turned to a pillar of salt. So Lot and his daughters, they're out in the wilderness in this land. And they've just seen fire come out of the sky, destroy destroy these cities. They're out in the wilderness. They think the world has come to an end and that they're all that's left. That's what what they're seeing from their perspective. So they do, when you're reading the story, they do what you don't want them to do. When you're reading the story, it's like, oh, God, please don't do this. And they do it. And that incident of incest between Lot and his daughters produces a baby. And that baby is the father of the Moabite people, an inbred Repulsive origin, no doubt, but it gets even worse than this. The Moabites become a relatively powerful people in the land that they're living in, even driving out a race of giants from one territory, which they occupied in the highlands near the Dead Sea. All right, so they're living in the highlands. So I guess it's worth mentioning uh, here with the Moabite origin story and the geographical reality of where they lived in these highlands, the Moabites become history's first documented inbred hillbillies. Just a little side note there I picked up as I was reading the story. They're also an idolatrous nation. They worship false gods. They did all sorts of things that other nations and people in these lands did. But a major turning point in the Moabite story comes when Moses was leading the people of Israel through the wilderness. The Israelites actually skirted around the land of Moab rather than going through Moab itself. But their presence so near the Moabite borders, it really freaks out the Moabite king. So he hires a prophet named Balaam to pronounce a curse on the Israelites. And that curse failed, but it angered God that the king of the Moabites would even attempt this. So in Deuteronomy, in the book that captures the final words of Moses, we get this list of people who are excluded from being part of the congregation of Israel. Now, one thing we'll see in the story of David as we we go through the episodes ahead is that there are a lot of Gentiles, a lot of non-Jewish people that are part of this story. These were people who chose to follow God, people who were brought into the camp, into the nation of Israel. This happened under Moses too. But there were some people, even with that, there were some people who were just out and out forbidden. Deuteronomy 23 tells us who those people are, who it is that's not allowed. Now check out who's on this list. This is Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 to 6. It says, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. You shall not seek their peace 
nor their prosperity all your days forever. Deuteronomy 23, 3 to 6. Bitter, eternal enemies is basically what's being described here. Later, after the Babylonian captivity, when the Jews return in the book of Nehemiah, we see this vow, this curse repeated again. So we're talking long-term grudge here. So right out of the gate, when we look at Ruth, the great-grandmother of David, we've got some problems here. How did this woman, a Moabite, get included in the genealogy of Jesus and David? Now, I've read a lot of articles, a lot of commentaries, theories on this. Some say Ruth changed her lineage when she clung to Naomi. She changed God's then, and, and that was what redeemed her. Nice thought, I guess, but I think anyone could have done that if they wanted to. And some people did do that. You know, there, there were the, the righteous, those people who did turn from their gods, turn from their Gentile ways and become people of the book, so to speak. But not any of them was mentioned in the curse from God recorded in Deuteronomy 23. Honestly, I don't think there is a good explanation for what happens here or for why Ruth and ultimately God decided to include Ruth, the Moabite woman, in this story. And here's the point. One of the things we'll see in the life of David over and over again is that the rules get broken. We can come up with a lot of uh, lofty explanations for why, but those explanations ultimately are pretty weak. The vow against the Moabites is stated before and then long after the life of David. It didn't go away. Right out of the gate then, we find David in his origin story, a breaking of the rules. And that reality in his origin story may be even bigger than this. We're going to look at a later episode. There may be even more here than we realize. But this is the setting for our hero. This is the setting at the, at the time of David's arrival on the scene. A time of chaos, oppression, confusion, frustration. It's the time of the judges and the eye of God turns to this bloodline, a, a bloodline of a loyal and honorable Moabite woman. But this is just the start of it. In our next episode, we're going to look at Samuel. Now, he's the guy, the prophet, that anoints David as king over Israel. But he's also one of the top five most important figures in the Old Testament as I see it. That's where we're going to turn in our next episode in this series on the life of David. Be sure to subscribe to the show blog to the podcast. If you haven't already, be among the first to catch next week's episode when it drops. I think that's scheduled for Tuesday of next week. Meanwhile, head to jbshreve.com, check out the accompanying blog series entitled A Journey Through Psalms that I'm posting along with this podcast series. I think that's going to do it. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back soon. <laughs>